All right. So hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. I'm super stoked and excited to be here. Uh, my name is Avik. I am a data scientist at Intuit. This is my colleague, Bala, um, you know, who is a senior staff software engineer. Um, and today, I'm going to talk about the AI-driven progressive delivery and um, really show how we, uh, we were able to achieve this purely using open source tools. So our goal from this talk is to give you a solid intuition behind the whole process uh, you know, so that you guys can implement this yourself. All right, so with that, so the agenda is that we're going to start with what is progressive delivery, talk about that, uh, and then go straight away into AI-based progressive delivery. Uh, and then finally, we will actually go a bit deeper into the multivariate anomaly detection and, like, and also how did we implement that. Okay, and then finally a demo. All right, and by the way, I am having a bad throat, so if I sound funny, so please excuse me. Uh, okay, so like at Intuit, our mission is to power prosperity, uh, like you know, around the world. And if you haven't heard of Intuit, uh, we are actually a global fintech company that is building an AI native development platform. Uh, we serve about 100 million you know customers across our various brands, um, namely TurboTax, Credit Karma, QuickBooks, and Mailchimp. Uh, we are really excited to be here, and uh, you know, as we are big users of open source tools, and we love giving back to the open source community. So a little bit more about our platform. So our AI native uh, development platform is massive in scale, okay? And it like, supports over four uh, a million models running in production every day. And our dev velocity has increased 8x uh, you know, over the past four years. And the platform you know, it powers more than, or you know, about around you know, 60 billion machine learning predictions uh, you know, per day. And one of the most exciting parts about working at Intuit is how much open source software we use to build our dev platform. Uh, we received the end user award in 2019 and you know, 2022. Um, and we love to create and open source many projects here at Intuit, especially our GoNima project, et cetera, which I think many of you know about. So with that, let's move on to the core part of our talk. So what really is progressive delivery? Like, I'm pretty sure many of you know this, but we'll just you know, brush up on that. So uh, you know, progressive delivery is basically a gradual release of a new version, all right? So uh, and the reason we do it is because it reduces the risks of bugs and failures, and it reduces the impact of bad experiences like for the end users and customers. So, and it also gives us a quick rollback mechanism. So if something goes wrong, we can just roll it back. Um, and a very good example is the Canary deployments, right? The you know, Canary-based rollbacks and the Canary-based uh, you know, progressive delivery. Um, and a very good example here is the Argo rollouts, which we have been using for a long time. Um, and uh, yeah, so you know, for this purpose, we use Argo rollouts as well. Uh, okay, now let's talk about why do we need to incorporate AI and ML uh, you know, into this whole system, uh, right? But first, we need to see what is, the diff so, you know, what is the exact problem that we are trying to solve using a progressive delivery system. So let's first define what change-induced incidents are. So we saw that more than one-third of the P0 and P1, the most critical incidents at Intuit, were caused by changes. Now, these changes could be anything. It could be new features, it could be uh, like any kind of bug fix that we wanted to add, but it turned out to be a bug in itself, so that can happen. And then um, even like some simple dependency upgrades, right? It could be some new version of maybe NumPy or you know, Pandas or anything, right? Uh, but that could cause uh, you know, catastrophic failures uh, you know, inside the you know, production system. And well, it can be really avoided, or the reduction in the impact can really be done if it's detected early and resolved early. So how do we prevent them? Um, the most basic way, as we all know, is just a static thresholding-based rollback, okay? So what do we do? So we basically set a hard threshold, like for every metric that you care about for your application. So for example, if you care about error rate, you can just say, hey, you know, set a hard deadline or a hard threshold for you know, 4% error rate, and that should be all, 
Okay, anything, any point that goes above that threshold, you just roll back automatically. And you do that for every single metric that you care about. So maybe latency, the request latency. So 400 milliseconds is the hard threshold. If anything goes above that, you roll back. So that's all there is to it, right? And it is a very quick and easy way to go about this. But uh, like, of course, there are some drawbacks. The main drawback is that every service is unique. So what you have for your service, the metrics and the thresholds, is completely different or can be completely different to my service. So I can have an ML inference service that can tolerate up to one second of latency because it's doing you know, a lot of number crunching. But you might have a really mission critical service where uh, like even 100 millisecond latency is disastrous. All right? So that's one. So that's why you will have different thresholds and then different metrics that make sense for your application as well. So you might think that error rate is not really important for you. Like for you, may, maybe some kind of a you know, clickstream data might be important, right? So it really depends on the person and the application there. And this could be non-operational metrics as well. This could be some kind of business metric that you care about, okay? Like, you know, number of customers that really clicked on to your login page. It could be something like that. Um, and then, the, one of the main problems of static thresholding is that you, you are trying to just detect global anomalies. So anomalies that you can actually, so if you zoom out a time series and you can just pinpoint there is an anomaly, that's global, okay? Because you can really see that something has gone horribly wrong and there is a you know, high anomaly there, right? But not all anomalies are global. Um, because you know, time series metrics are very seasonal. So it could be that you have daily seasonality, even weekly seasonality. Right? So the you know, traffic goes up in the day, and it falls into the night. And similarly for the weekdays and the weekends. So there could be some contextual an anomalies happening within that you know, particular time window. So that is something that the you know, static thresholds I mean, simply cannot uh, really detect. And then also multiple metrics collectively determine the system health. Okay? It's not just one metric or you know, if just one metric goes wrong, you just roll back everything. No, it's actually a collectively, uh, like a you know, coherent mechanism where all of these different metrics determine the system health in a multivariate fashion. Okay, and and of course they they might not be uh, like you know of e of equal weightage. It could be that you you are saying that for your application that error rate is the most important. You give like 30% weightage to that, right? But for CPU and memory, probably you don't care much, so you just give like 10% there. So that's also one more thing, all right? So now with that, I will move on to the multivariate anomaly detection. Now before that, I just want to ask in the audience, how many of you have background in data science and ML? Okay, very few, but no worries. Uh, my goal is to give you a broad intuition behind the approach regardless, all right? Um, all right, so now we're gonna talk about the multivariate anomaly detection. But before that, what is a multivariate metric? Or, it, or I would say, what are multivariate metrics and how does it look like? So you can see this is how uh, a typical service, uh, I would say, the you know, golden signal metrics look like, all right? So you can see that how different each metrics are. For example, the error rate and latency follow like a proper seasonality. It's uh, daily as well as weekly, you can see that. Uh, but error rate has a large amount of variance in the data. So there is, there is a lot of spikes there. So here, as you can see, this is, this is an example of a contextual anomaly. If you had a global anomaly here, okay, it wouldn't be able to detect this contextual anomaly here, right? And then similarly, you have CPU and memory which show an upward trend. So these are different structures in the time series that are there and that we need to tackle. So before that, we need to define some requirements from both from the ML perspective and from the engineering perspective, all right? So you know, first of all, the ML model needs to be completely unsupervised. By unsupervised, I mean that we don't have the luxury of target labels in the data, you know, which can specify if the data is anomalous or not. So we don't, we don't have that luxury. So it's completely up to the model to actually understand uh, like from the data by itself and say whether that point is anomalous or not, all right? It needs to, of course, it needs to handle multiple features, right? Because we are talking about multivariate here. Uh, yeah, so it needs to understand the underlying structure of the time series, the seasonality, the trend, uh, the noise a little bit. And then it should be fairly quick to train. The, and the reason I say that is because we, we need to deploy this pipeline 
uh, deploy these models into different clusters, okay? So it needs to be fairly quick, and there are many different applications running add into it, you know, within those clusters, okay? Um, and, you know, storage is expensive. So we need to make sure that um, it can perform well with not more than eight days' worth of data of training, all right? And also generate interpretable anomaly scores. I mean, something that any end user can look at it and say, okay, the anomaly looks high or the anomaly looks good. But not something like, you know, some ML engineer or, or data scientist like me needs to just go and debug that, right? Um, and it also, you know, it should handle auto model lifecycle management. So if a model goes stale or something like that, it should be able to retrain it and then have a fresh new model on that. Now, from the engineering standpoint, we also have a few requirements there. So first of all, all of this whole thing is actually real time. So there needs to be a streaming data processing system, which is very, very important. Okay, and it needs to support custom sources and sinks. Now, why custom? Well, I could, I could want to, uh, let's say I want to get the data from Prometheus or Thanos, all right? That, that would be a custom source. Well, you might want to use a different source for that. Um, and similarly for the sinks, I, I might want to, you know, send the data out to Wavefront or maybe Prometheus again, back again, or, you know, whatnot. So that is very important. And then the most important is that the sliding window aggregation support. Now, this is critical because the model needs to be fed sequences of data for it to understand the underlying structure of the metric. So if you just send it one data point, it just won't understand it because it just, like, cannot understand the, you know, the time series patterns uh, you know, of the data, okay? So this is very important, and we'll come to that. And then it has to be lightweight. I mean, since we are deploying this to multiple clusters, it has to be lightweight, uh, easy to deploy to multiple clusters, and then we also need to choose the right tool for progressive delivery, and in this case, of course, we used our rollouts, which worked really good. So I'll explain the concept from a broad level first, and then we will keep going deeper and deeper, okay? So, so here you can see that I have a service, and I have just picked the golden signal metrics, which is the error rates, latency, CPU, and the memory. So this is plain and simple. There's a service which is generating some metrics. In this case, the golden signal metrics, and there we are storing those metrics in the Prometheus store. Okay, fairly simple. Now, let's take that and see what happens during a progressive delivery, okay? Now, what's going on is that same service is generating the metrics, um, uh, and you know, saving to the Prometheus store. But now, during progressive delivery, it is now generating a second set of metrics, which is for the Canary deployment. Okay, so we have the stable and Canary. So the unstable is the current version, and the Canary is the new version. So we are generating the metrics, uh, the unstable metrics, and you know, saving that to the Prometheus store, and similarly for the Canary. And finally, what happens is that we, we actually pull those data into the ML pipeline, which we will dive deeper into, and, but it comes in two different payloads. All right, so we, we actually get the you know, payload for the stable and canary, and, and finally, the expected output is we generate anomaly scores for both of those payloads. So we generate an anomaly score for the you know, stable version and also for the canary version, all right? So and now we'll focus on a very critical step of the whole pipeline, which is the sliding window aggregation. And uh, remember, so I talked about that the model needs the data in a sequence for it to understand. Right? So what we do here is, let's assume that we have a sliding window size of three, all right? And let's just assume for simplicity, we are just looking at two multivariate metrics. One is error rate and one is the latency, okay? So here how it goes. So you have the Prometheus store, and we are you know, fetching the metric at time t, which is the current time, let's uh, look at that, right? So you have the error rate and the latency. So we get a vector, okay, just a you know, size of two. Then the sliding window reducer, when you pass through it, what you get is actually a matrix. So you get not only the data for the current timestamp, but also at t minus one and t minus two. That way we have a sliding window size of three, and then finally this can be fed into the model so that it can understand the data in a sequence, all right? So now we're gonna go deeper into the ML inference steps, all right? So um, this might look complex, but trust me, it is fairly simple. I'll just go over each of them one by one. So we have the sliding window reducer from the last slide, right? And we are getting, so, you know, and we are getting the data in a windowed fashion. The first thing that we do is we need to pre-process the data. Now, why is that? 
Now, the model usually requires the data to be normalized between a certain range. Usually, that is between 0 and 1, or maybe minus 1 to 1. All right? That is, that is one thing. The second thing is that the, you know, life is not that simple. Uh, I mean, there are so many spikes and all of that in the data that we might need to smoothen some of the spikes to just get the real structure out of it. Okay? It, could, it could be very spiky there. Right? So that is optional, but we, you know, we sometimes like to do that as well. Now then, that, that pre-processed data passes into the main neural network. Now here, we, we actually get the raw output from the model. Okay? Raw output meaning that it is, it is basically an unbounded value, um, and then it is very difficult to interpret what that means. All right? uh, now it's very important to know that we are using the same model to predict for both the stable and the canary payloads. That is, that is critical here. All right? And I'll come to the training later, but that's what's happening here. And then finally, that raw output is sent into the post-process step where we are actually just normalizing the output score to be more human interpretable. So maybe you want to have a probability distribution maybe between 0 to 1, or you might want something like, uh, uh, something like 0 to 10, where 0 means uh, you know, it's not anomalous at all, and 10 meaning it's the highest anomaly. So it is a range of severity that you can you know, get out of it. All right? uh, and then you get the single scalar value for each window there. All right. Now, this is the inference flow. Now, what happens the first time you onboard your application? Well, there is no model there, right? So what happens is that it checks for whether the model exists. If it does not, so, you know, if it does not exist, then it passes on to the trainer, which trains the model from the historic data stored in Prometheus. Remember, we have been you know, putting those data inside Prometheus. So we you know, fetch eight days worth of historic data. Now here we are not training on maybe, let's say, you know, stable and canary versions differently. No, we are just training on the stable versions because that's the one that we care about, right? That's the pattern we want, to, we want our model to understand, all right? And then it's saved, and then that's it. And then the next time, the you know, inference pipeline can take that model up, all right? So now I'll go a little bit about the model details. Uh, not very detailed, but a little bit about what we are doing there. So the good thing is that all of these models are available in Numalogic, uh, okay, which is open source. So, so these models are quick to train even without GPUs. I mean, that was one of the fundamental like, things we wanted to achieve there. Um, it's robust to anomalies in the training data. As I said, the training data is not perfect. There, there are anomalies, and there are no labels associated with those anomalies that we can just remove them, right? Because that's another engineering effort. So it's robust to anomalies in the training data as well. Um, you also have the mechanism to feature weigh them, right? So uh, maybe let's say latency is 40%, uh, you know, and then your error rate is 40% as well, and CPU and memory is 10%, 10%. So you could do that, or you could just keep it all even. That's up to you. And then the anomaly scores are interpretable. Now, why is that? Because we generate two kinds of anomaly scores. One is a unified anomaly score, which means that for all of your metrics, you're getting just one score output. Okay? So one score that can determine your system health. And then you also have a per metric score. So let's say you have 10 metrics that you're feeding into the model. You will, have, you will have anomaly scores for all those 10 metrics. That way, you can go back, backtrack, and see whether, you know, which metric is the one that is most likely cause of anomaly, all right? And then, so, you know, talk a little bit about the network itself. We use, uh, you know, convolutional neural network and recurrent neural networks. So these are, you know, pretty robust and, you know, one of the best ways to model time series, okay? And uh, the way we do that, is we use an autoencoder network. Now, I won't go deep into this, but just understand this. The autoencoder has two components to it. One is the encoder, one is the decoder, all right? The encoder takes the input data and tries to compress the data, the input data, into a compressed representation, all right? The decoder takes that compressed representation and tries to reconstruct the original data in the same dimension. But if the input data has anomalies, the reconstruction would be very bad. And that's the basis of the whole anomaly score that we have here. Okay. Uh, if you didn't understand that, don't worry about it. Uh, you can actually come and talk to me there. So now this is one example of the output. And the most important thing to note here is the feature scores. Okay. So here in the feature scores, you can see that we have different scores for latency, CPU, error rate, and memory. Okay. And we have weighed them accordingly. So this is, latency is like 40% here. And then you have a final unified score, which is a weighted average of these uh, you know, feature scores here. 
So now I'll hand it over to Bala here. Yep. Thank you, Avik. So let's dive into like a real world, how we can go into implement this, all the concept into Intuit. So let me jump into that architecture level. So in Intuit, we are using a Prometheus as a metrics collector. The Prometheus is going to collect that all the service metrics every 30 seconds and inject into our AI pipeline. In the AI pipeline, we have like a windowing. So there we will group that all the metrics into the service and the rollout hash and pass it into that ML steps like a pre-processing and inference. Once that anomaly score is generated in the post-processing step and it will push it back to the Prometheus. So that Argo rollout will query that unified anomaly score during that canary deployment and assess that how the new deployment will be good or bad. So one of the engineering requirement on the AI pipeline, it need to be real-time streaming. So we are using a NumaFlow as a streaming pipeline. What is NumaFlow? The NumaFlow is the Intuit open source project, which is like a Kubernetes native serverless platform for running the scalable and reliable stream processing engine. It's a, it's a totally very lightweight, so you can run it in the Raspberry Pi or anything. So that, that's the main requirement in that uh, AI pipeline because we are going to deploy this AI pipeline in every cluster and it needs to be like a, a very cost efficient and very lightweight. The second, it's a language ag agnostics uh, because some of the ML vertex need to be implemented in the Python and some of the sync or source need to be implemented in Java or um, Golang. So the NumaFlow is coming with uh, is, uh, the popular language SDKs like a Java, Python, Golang, and Rust. So you can easily implement it. It's a very easy to implement. And it's coming with the inbuilt uh, source and syncs for the famous streaming tools like a Kafka, NATS, HTTP request. In our AI pipeline, we are mainly using a HTTP source and sync so that it is receiving that uh, metrics from the Prometheus using a remote writer. And uh, the NumaFlow is coming with uh, out of box auto scaling. So every vertex will scale independently based on that back pressure of the vertex. And it's a, it's a lightweight so that it's a very cost efficient too. Okay, let's get into the fun part is a demo. Everybody's waiting for that. So let me uh, lay down that what is my demo plan. I'm going to do the two demos. One is like a live demo. The second one is a recorded demo. The live demo, I'm going to see the real-time A pipeline, which is currently getting the metrics from the Prometheus and generating anomaly score for each services. The second one is a recorded one, how the progressive delivery is happening and using the anomaly score. Okay. Okay, so this is the NumaFlow UI. So NumaFlow UI is packed with a lot of features. So that will help you to manage your pipeline as well as you can debug your pipeline. You can see that this is the ML pipeline running on the live cluster. And you can see that you can easily find like how is your health of your pipeline? How is the message lagging is happening on the real time? And basically you can see that every vertex, how much of the processing speed and how much auto scaling is happening here. So this is the window vertex. As Avik said, we are, we are aggregating, aggregating the, all the metrics with the previous data points. So currently we are using a window length is a 12, it's a real time. So n to n minus 12 data points will be passed into the inference to generate anomaly score. Let me go to the inference, you can see that so every, every, every uh, data points will be inferenced and generating anomaly score. And you did it, I think you noticed here, the NumaFlow UI is giving like a, every vertex is how much CPU is utilizing, how much memory is utilizing. And you can see that all the container details, all the memory utilization details here. So that if any problem, you can, you no need to go to the cluster or anything. You can just come to here and just uh, debug it. So finally, we have like a Prometheus sync, which is receiving that all the payload from the ML, vert ML vertices and pushing into the Prometheus. You can see that here, it is 
pushing that every anomaly square into the Prometheus so that it will be get ready for Argo rollout to hurry and uh, assess that. Okay, let's go to the second demo, which is a recorded demo. So I have a service which is deployed into the Argo rollout, and I have a an analysis template, which is like a monitoring that unified anomaly score. If it is a greater than four, it will be failed, and uh, less than four will be passed. So in Intuit, we are using anomaly score ranges zero to 10. Zero to four will be good. Greater than four will be uh, anomalous. So I have a buggy image, which is created, create a lightly increased uh, error rate and latency, because my service is configured uh, weightage of error rate and latency is high, like a 40%, 40%, and CPU and memory is a 10%. So I'm going to merge that new image. Then Argo CD will immediately detect it, and it will try to sync it. So you can see that once it's sync, you can immediately see that the canary pod will coming into that. So you can see that the canary new pod is created because I created like a 30% traffic routing. And you can see that analysis run was start running and uh, looking into the anomaly scores. So I moved into the dashboard. You can see that currently that all the stable hashes, stable anomaly scores are coming into the dashboard. You can see that because the service is running normally with uh, low latency and uh, error rate, you can see that there is no anomaly at all. So it's all less than one. So let's wait for that canary pod to accept that traffic and start generating anomaly score. You can see that the canary pod's matrices are start coming. Let's wait for the CPU to come, okay. So if you see that, as I said, my buggy image has like a slightly increased error rate and latency from the normal service. So you can see that the future, each individual feature's anomaly was very high because it's, it's not a normal pattern, it's a little bit anom anomalous. So it's went up. So that if you see that the unified anomaly score based on the weightage, it's increased to the more, greater than four. Let's go to that uh, uh, rollout to see that how it is detecting. So anomalous, uh, analysis, Run, I'm going there, so you can see that, which was already detected greater than four and it's already flagging like uh, your image has failed. So once it's three times it's failed, they, it will automatically revert back your new image. So you can see that it's already degraded and it's, it's failed that anal analysis run and uh, it is rolled back your uh, normal image. Okay, that's all I have. Sorry. Let me go back to the slide. Okay, thank you guys. Uh, I'm from Pneumaflow and uh, Pneumologic King Avic also. Yep, so this, all the, model and all the pipelines and everything's open source. You can go to that Numa Proge GitHub repo and you can find this all the pipeline and all the models. You can just uh, deploy into your cluster, it will run out of box with Argo rollout. Any questions? All right, thank you. Yeah? Yes. <laughs> thank you, guys. Well, so I can take that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so the question is that how do you plan for, um, you know, something that you foresee is going to happen, like on the metric side, like, for example, if we know that a new change is going to increase the memory and the you know, CPU there, right? So from an MLOps standpoint, I think it's fairly straightforward that you discard that model, okay? 
because what you're basically saying is that this new change is completely has a completely different distribution from what I had seen before. Okay, so you just discard that model, and then it will do the retraining again on the like on the newer metrics as you said. Uh, but it might take maybe a day to you know get all those metrics and get a reliable anomaly score there. So we have had these uh, these issues. So we do have some fail-safe checks that we also incorporate like an ensemble model with with some kind of a static thresholding just to keep everything at check there. Would you ever consider developing a model with lower environment? The lower environment, the problem is that the metrics would be different. So if let's say that I like talk about the QA, right? The QA, if your application is in QA, it's not getting any traffic at all. One thing that you could do though, having the same traffic in staging environment, something like that, and those same metrics, you can actually train that. Train your model there and just transfer that model into prod. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Good question, though. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah, OK. So the question is that, um, well, these models seem very complex. Why not just use some kind of an LLM um, and just like, say that this is, this is how the data looks like and how this will? OK. Uh, and first of all, our models are much, much more simpler than an LLM. Uh, OK, because an LLM by default is much, much complex. We just see from the outside and just an API. That's why it seems very um, like simple, right? But um, Another thing, this is the first thing we tried. So after LLM came out, LLMs came out, we first tried giving it a time series data and then uh, you know, seeing how the output looks like. It's not good at all. Okay. It just does not understand numeric values that well at all. Um, yes? Yeah, OK. So the question is, was there any kind of vector database usage uh, that, can be, that can be then used upon by an LLM? Uh, no, there is no vector database, because if you, if you think about it, if you need an embedding, you're actually embedding some in textual information, right? But that would come in handy as, an, as a downstream task, OK? But not at the core functionality of the anomaly detection. If let's say you want to you want to give out something uh, like a like a humanly interpretable you know, message saying that why and which metric is the most cause of anomaly, you could do that for sure. You could do that, okay? And that's something that we have been working on as well. Uh, you know, something that takes the output from our models and then use them. All right. Hope that was clear. Yeah. Hey, thanks for the talk. Um, how widely have you rolled out this approach in your own organization, and like, how often do you encounter false positives? What is it? So the question is that how widely have we used this um, in our own organization? Oh, and and how much of false positives have we seen? Do you want to take that? Yeah, yeah. So basically, like, uh, we we deployed this pipeline to the across that all the uh, into clusters, like almost like a four fifty cluster suite. And uh, we are currently migrating that all the services, which are the static threshold template into the things. Currently, we are almost running like a 500 services on the AOPS-based progressive delivery. So far, we don't see, like we see that like 1% of the false positive, but uh, which is more related to that uh, the service, which has like a, typically like their error rate will be always high during the deployment. So that we are adjusting the window length for the services to accommodate that initial ramp up time. Other than that, it's working very well. Yeah, so, so to add to that, there is also one more thing that in, in the analysis template, we have a setting where it says that, OK, anything greater than four, you roll back. Like four meaning the anomaly score. Well, the users have the ability to just change that value. We just give them a default value that will just work 85% of the time. 
right? Because that's all, all we can do as a default like template and application. But then they can just go ahead and do numerous things. One, give uh, or like add their own custom metrics which makes sense for them. Most of the false positives actually come which we have seen is because like for example, maybe latency doesn't work for them at all. Or CPU and memory, maybe it's a Java service where there is always a, you know, always a spike and drop in the CPU and memory whenever, you know, whenever there is a new pod coming up. So it, in those cases, they just say, hey, this does not work for us. So we'll give us our own metric. And the cool thing is that all of this works with their own custom metrics as well, as long as they have the data in Prometheus. And really this, cool. Thank you, guys. Of yeah. course. This, everything is a config base. So you can configure like every service ind independently. Yeah, please. Okay. No, yeah, yeah. You can you can run that n number of analysis to compare like a multiple uh, AI scores, right. and you can run that uh, perf environment scores also, like uh, how that you are stage environment scores and all the things you can compare it. No, no, but uh, in TTU's case, we are just started with the production environment, not comparing anything else, because. In Intuit, the stage is mainly for like a make sure, not getting the production traffic to assess that uh, things. So that's why only the production things we are considering. Yeah, but you can do like any way you want it for your own application. Okay, there is there is nothing stopping you from doing doing certain things like that. And like to his first question about the the different kinds of error rate, you could do that because the service owner is responsible for getting those metrics out, right? So if you are a service owner. And you are saying that I have two different sets of error rate, okay, for the you know for the client side and for the server side. You could do that. Get it so I'm get it out, and all we need to do is change in the configuration to get those metrics out. You can add the weightage as well, and it will just work seamlessly. There is nothing um, weird about it. To uh, yeah. But. Uh, so you showed you're running your anomaly detection on your stable version as well. Uh, two questions: Do you use that for just generic alerting on? running services, and how do you incorporate that into, oh, there's an anomaly in the stable version at the same time you're deploying, so your canary has that, how do you deal with that? Yeah, I mean, great question. So the question is that we, we uh, give out anomaly scores for canary and stable versions. What do we use the stable version score for? Okay, so there are, I mean, two uh, reasons for it. The first reason is that the stable version score give the end users just a holistic health of of your system, like it just gives uh, just an anomaly score just to see that where, where you can set your alerts, your you know pager duties, and all of that. So that's that's great because you want you want to set that on the stable version, not on the you know canary version. That's one. The you know second thing is that yes, you could use that. So during a deployment, you can actually have both of them and then do a downstream analysis saying that hey, my canary score was high. But if my stable score was also high, probably there is some problem in the upstream or downstream, and not my application. Okay, that is possible. We have not done that yet, but that's in our roadmap, and that's a that's a great question. We could use that, of course. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. Okay, so in that case, so, so you have to think about it, how you can get those metrics in, okay? That's the only constraint. Once the system has the required metrics for your new version, you can just do it. So if you can somehow, if you somehow get those data in, in your CI CD pipeline, you could actually run that. It's no problem. Yeah. But you have to be creative with that, <laughs> right? And intuitive, yeah. intuitive, we have like a perf environment. 
which will simulate the, uh, the production traffic. So we are monitoring that one. We are generating an anomaly score on the perf environment. So generating a load to make sure there is no anomaly. But which is not like a, like a progressive delivery. We will deploy it and make sure the stable one was st anomaly stable. We are simulating the production traffic in the perf environment. Okay? Okay. Thank you, guys. No, no, come here.